Hi, this video aims to bring you some highlights that Miss Coffee Bean picked for you from the ACL 2023 conference in Toronto last week. We will show you some poster sessions, and if you're interested in the second keynote at ACL from Professor Alison Gopnik arguing that large language models are a cultural technology, check out our last video. So here we are at the ACL 2023 Toronto poster session. We will have some hopefully interesting discussions with the authors and I hope that they will be able to explain their stuff in simple terms because you know authors usually tend to be really experts in the thing they have written about because they have spent at least a few months if not a year with the topic or even more. So it would be really great if we can prompt them, like one of our language models, to talk in simple terms about the work. So let's see. Here is some coffee from the future. Importantly, you can find links to the papers of the interviewed authors in the description below, as well as their Twitter profile. Small disclaimer, unfortunately I do not have a clean audio track of my questions, so I re-recorded them in post-production where needed. Enjoy! So basically, competitive programming is solving some kind of coding problems which are somewhat similar to interview problems at big tech companies. So a thing that really characterizes those problems and make them different from, let's say, human eval data set, which is just natural language to code, is that to solve such a problem, you really need to come up with some sort of an idea, which is not obvious by looking at the problem statement. For instance, if you have a very simple problem that you have an array of integers with different signs, and you want to check if it's possible to make this array sorted just by swapping signs of any two integers. So you can already see that the brute force solution is not feasible for this problem. There are too many combinations. So you need to come up with some idea. And the idea is super simple. It's, you just need to observe that to, for this array to be sorted, you need to have like negative numbers first. So you just need to move the negative uh, signs to the beginning. So just count the negative. So apparently, the problem that I just described is not solvable by GPT-4. At least it wasn't like three months ago when I tested it. So it means that GPT-4 is no good at competitive level programming. OpenAI actually has published a result saying that it has a rating of 392, which is, if you're familiar with chess ratings, you can see that the maximum rating is around 3K, which is like grandmaster levels. And the level of this problem is around 800. So it's very simple. And GPT has like 400. It means that it's definitely no good at solving such. As a competitive programmer yourself, how do you feel about these results and how do you think the capabilities of large language models will change in the future iterations? Yeah, I definitely feel like very inspired that I can use my prior experience from high school when I did that to actually try to improve the reasoning of large language models. I do think that this type of tasks uh, could be the kind of next generation of evals for large language models because right now everyone is concerned about human eval which is just generating code from pretty much detailed instructions with a little bit of something non-obvious but it's not on that level but once the language models improve there will be definitely some more challenging evals required and this is definitely very challenging because you already see that those models are not good at even solving like 800 problems. So actually AlphaCode developed an approach that uh, enabled to solve like 1500 rated problems. But the issue is that they sample huge amount of solutions. Here we're talking about sampling 10 solutions from a language model. So if we can wait, if we want to wait at a moment where a person competing on this website, the code forces can basically cheat and copy-paste the statement to ChatGPT and get correct code, it's definitely going to happen in some time, but it's, it's going to take some time. It's not happening now. Isn't it a bit ironic that you are working towards making models better at coding, so you program them to steal your job? Kind of. I mean, when I started 
doing research in, in language models, my motivation was that someday, if I like stay being like software engineer, I might get replaced. And I think everything is going into this direction. Maybe not replaced, but I think in 10 years a lot of jobs will be a lot of job will be done by language models or or like the descendants of language models that we don't know. But actually there will be a job of a software engineer will be definitely different than it is today. More powerful autocompletes. Well, maybe, but I think also approaches like uh, auto GPT. Once once those models get uh, more powerful, like we get more powerful base models, it's gonna do like crazy stuff. Like basically, it's gonna write like the entire scripts with like some very few instructions, and yeah, it's gonna boost the productivity, which is nice. It's especially useful for researchers because deep learning researchers don't usually like to write like data pre-processing code and so on. I'm already using, when I train large language models, I'm already using GPT-4 to generate data pre-processing code because I'm so lazy to write it myself. Aren't you worrying about putting the tool of programming into everybody's hands since these models can code from just descriptions in natural language? I mean, there is something to it, like definitely need some regulation, but on the other hand, it's like, it's just people will be bothered with with different stuff, like with more difficult conceptual stuff. Because it's not obvious how how fast these models will get better at, at, at these tasks. Like it it will just shift the work towards reasoning from coding. And I think it's useful. Like one of the reasons I don't want to become a software engineer for life is that I get pretty bored with doing this infrastructure and stuff. There's not much of like once I have like one or two years of experience, I, I get bored. And actually, I've heard this from so many researchers that transition from, transition from software engineering to deep learning. Last question. Do these large language models understand? Oh, that's, that's such a great question. I mean, I don't want to make any, any sort of faux pas here. You cannot forget that we are at a linguistics conference. I would say, well, I would say it probably doesn't matter. Like. What people care about is actually to solve these problems. So no matter if they understand or not, they will get better with time, basically. People are even controversial with reasoning, like with reasoning. And I think there is something to reasoning that makes it like when I solved these problems in high school, it was really about, not about being super creative, but about memorizing lots of solutions and then associating those solutions. And like one of the hypotheses of, of mine, at least like very kind of high level intuition, what is happening inside large language models is that they develop such representations that allow for like better associations actually. So obviously the more you train on the better. So like if your test set becomes the train set, that's, that's the ideal thing. But, but yeah, in, in terms of competitive programming, I think it requires some like advances in, in, in data efficiency. Because right now the, the amount of tokens of, of this type of task is like less than a billion, definitely. Like, which means that if we follow the scaling laws, it's it's not going to improve much. By the way, Simon is the author of Long Llama that came out a few days ago. So do check it out if you're interested in llama models scaling to really long text. Why are large language models bad at numerical reasoning? So one of the things that I'm hypothesizing just by looking at this little part of the table is that the, the, the bigger the parameters, the more complex reasoning is doing. So I think it's the same as if you were asking, maybe it's a bit trivial to say that, but if you were asking a complex math question to a six year old, they wouldn't be able to do it. But the more they're used to kind of like seeing maths and doing more, they do, they're able to perform more mathematical, mathematically complex ones. And it might be to do with parameters. It might be to do with encoding and tokenization. Um, but I mean, the, the real answer is, I don't know. That's why I'm doing this work. <laughs> what is the importance of tokenization? Yeah, so for example, when I, when I started this work, I used just BP or subword, whatever the tokenization was, and the results were just really bad. 
And then when I change to digit level tokenization, so I just take my digits, I um, just use the embedding for that individual digit, and then I put it together, um, concatenate them in, in, in a certain way, it does a lot better. Um, so the, in, in terms of just doing that little bit of digit tokenization made a massive impact. So working more on how to aggregate them, how to introduce some positional um, embeddings within those, within those digits, that's more, that's more encoding. Or, you know, I might need to tokenize it in a, you know, tokenize the decimal separately and have like the, the ones after the decimals, the ones before the decimals and the decimal points separately. Um, so, I mean, that's, that, that's definitely, two, definitely two areas to look at a lot more. Since LLMs are bad with adding numbers, for example, there are papers that let language models call tools to solve numerical problems. Why not use that? So you, exactly, and that's exactly what these API calls and tools yeah. papers do. But yeah, like, yeah. but what, what I'm actually looking at is I'm not looking at creating a math solver. What I'm looking at is I'm looking to understand how these models can improve their numerical reasoning. Because if, I, if I'm just generating text, I'm not doing anything, I'm not doing any math, I'm just generating text. Okay. And if I'm, genera I'm saying, okay, generate some text, and it's going, oh, um, I live in a one meter square house, that's ludicrous, right? So the, 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 the number understanding of it, of just, a, I'm generating a story, and it's giving me some, like, numbers that just, oh, I went out with uh, 25 friends to the cinema, it's like, well, like, is that really plausible? Yeah, you know, you, you want, you want some, maybe, maybe, you want, maybe, yeah, true. Yeah, 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 true. I don't think I can find 25 friends to actually go to the cinema with, but, uh, um, but yeah, it's, it's more about understand getting these models to do the maths um, in, in a, and understand numbers in a more holistic way like we do as humans. Because even as humans, if you tell me, I'll oh, multiply these two numbers like that, I wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah, I would need yeah, a calculator, exactly. right? And I completely agree with that part of it. But as a holistic thing, do they understand numbers and which numbers? So maybe I'm working with models that are working with a bio domain and I want, um, I want these decimal places to be good. I don't care about the rest of it, but I want the decimal to, to be relatively good at decimal. Or maybe I'm working with uh, the financial sector and I want these uh, large numbers to be good, but maybe the decimals, it doesn't matter if it gets one of the decimal places wrong. Why should we pre-train on downstream data? I mean, it sounds intuitive that training on downstream data should improve performance, but here you are saying one can forget the usual huge corpora for pre-training and do the mass language modeling objective on downstream data instead. Yeah, I guess the difference in this case is that we are not starting off of the base of like uh, pre-training of like Wikipedia or something. So like typically uh, that's something called TAP, which has been uh, addressed in like prior work. So like you have a model which is already pre-trained on lots of data, so it already knows, like has a lot of knowledge from there. And then you additionally add this uh, second step of pre-training, where you specialize it to on your downstream, like text basically. Not just the, la not the labels, just the text, unlabeled text. Uh, and that helps, and that has been known for a while. What we're saying is that if you skip this step entirely, the first one, yeah. where you don't use Wikipedia at all, it would still like give you some benefit. Like, and I guess the reason why it's surprising is because the same text is uh, used in fine tuning as well as pre-training. Yeah. So the, the interesting part is that there is something special about the mass language modeling objective or even the slightly more complicated pre-training objectives that are there in Electra, which just allow you to get more juice of, out of the same data. Yeah. I was just wondering, like, what's the progress in vision and language right now? Because you have a poster on measuring progress in fine grade vision and language understanding. Like, what's what's missing? What's missing? Uh, we need to improve fine grade understanding of these models. Like you showed in your paper yeah. last year, <laughs> these models struggle a lot with fine grade understanding. Where fine grade understanding is, is precise understanding between image and text modalities. Yeah. So something like I don't know, verbal understanding, where Giving a caption that says a woman lying with a dog, and given two images, both representing women and dogs. The model needs to correctly decide which images represent this caption based on the difference, which semantically is just the verb. And so, if you look at the performance of recent models, they still perform much worse on these kind of tasks than they do in uh, coarse grain tasks like image text retrieval or downstream tasks like visual question answering. Yeah, so I guess when the information is obvious, then the models kind of get it. 
but uh, the question is how like how can we improve this does gpt4 just you know by scaling everything up uh, is a promising approach or do you think that we need something else than just data and scaling and images and captions right so i think scaling the model size is something that helps unfortunately uh, the bitter lesson the bitter lessons scaling the data on the other hand might not be the only thing you need but is it because the data is just boring images and captions are usually uh, the captions of images are linguistically totally unvaried and boring so maybe if we could include more interesting text that is attached more loosely to the image then maybe that would help i think it's important like what we see like here is that you need to have precise descriptions of regions of the image so if you captions are like you know describing what's salient in the image and this might be very high level but if you have specific understanding, this can help a lot. When is a language model a language model? So uh, canonically, by, by Shannon's 1949 definition, a language model should be a distribution over the set of finite strings. But, the con uh, but uh, people usually define language models through this autoregressive factorization equation. Uh, which is equation one on the poster, and uh, that would uh, that would sometimes lead to uh, defining a language model that is not a language model, meaning that it's not a, a distribution over the set of finite strings. Because when you when you write down your language model like this, it, there is a possibility that your uh, that the model you're defining actually puts probability on the set of infinite strings. How to decide whether we have a language model or not? Oh yeah. So to answer that question, we first do have uh, we have first have to uh, understand what kind of distribution that this equation would induce. Uh, this equation actually induces a sp uh, very special type of uh, distribution over this particular set. It's a set of uh, finite strings uh, union with a uh, set of infinite strings. Because there is a possibility that EOS is never produced uh, in, a, uh, in a string, and th this distribution would po put positive probability on, on those strings. Yes. So this specific set is an uncountable set. And if you do not treat uncountable sets, uh, distributions over uncountable sets care uh, carefully, you would end up with paradoxes, which uh, mathematicians have been have uh, known since uh, towards the turn of 20th century, like uh, during the Cantor, during Cantor's age or early 20th century involving the work of uh, LeBeg and, uh, and uh, Burrell and uh, their peers. Yeah, exactly. That's the birth of magic theory. Why should an NLP researcher care whether a language model is formally a language model? Well, it's the it's kind of like the same reason that uh, well-trained mathematicians know mathematical analysis. Like you don't solve differential equations directly with uh, epsilon delta proofs, but uh, it's one of the trainings that you have to obtain uh, when you actually go on to do uh, more advanced mathematics. So if you want to actually do, if you want to actually understand the theory behind uh, NLP or NLP is mostly about engineering, but there's also some theor uh, theoretical aspects of it. And if you actually want to understand the theoretical uh, aspects of it, it's very good to have a solid theoretical underpinning. And Magic Theory is part of that. It's never have, it has never been um, put into papers before. And I feel like it's a good opportunity to uh, present uh, this uh, very uh, beautiful and uh, solid formulation of uh, magistry for uh, language models in this particular age. So is ChatGPT a language model? I, well, you have to ask open uh, we, know, we don't know what it looks like internally. Attention is all you need if you have uh, more than enough compute to um, deal with the quadratic complexity that transformers have. But if you don't, then you need different models that are better suited to like little data and little computer, right? Mm -hmm. So attention is probably all you need when you want to train a, a GPT-4 size model with web size data. But for other scenarios, it's not necessarily the best model. It also has inductive biases that make it a little more expensive in terms of data than other models. So yeah, when we have such a scenario, it's not on. And uh, what are the inductive biases your, of your alternative? And how does this compare to the vanilla transformer? So 
actually in, in our paper we try first of all to make the inductive biases that MLP mixer is lacking more similar to those of transformers and that is by doing weight shift. But in, in contrast to transformers we are not using attention we're using MLPs mm -hmm. and just MLPs that was the original idea of MLP mixer um, is simpler conceptually and might therefore also be more efficient in in terms of uh, amount of data that you need and amount of fine-tuning that you need and that's actually what we empirically find. You said that GPT-4-like transformers usually don't use uh, attention approximations like or let's say at attention alternatives why not? Like, um, wouldn't it be easier to train on the whole internet if you would be faster? Why isn't OpenAI interested in that that much, or why aren't they applying it? Um, I think they are very likely applying not vanilla attention, but probably something akin to flash attention, which is still an exact computation of attention, uh, but a much faster one. And then. Uh, so that is something that probably scales to 50,000 tokens or so uh, without too much trouble. But um, before that, the actual bottleneck of computation is not so much in the attention computation, but much more in the, in the feature mixing layer. Mm. So it's been shown that that is like where the majority of the computation takes place, not so much in the attention layer if you go up to like 50,000 tokens or so with flash attention. Mm. I think that's why they are not using it yet. But they need to find a, a way to deal with this eventually. Okay, so uh, you don't think it's also related to, the, to that winning lottery of uh, having one thing that works great and doing it just because everybody else did it and uh, you want to be comparable? That is definitely also a factor, like mm. training a GPT-4 size model, even with this kind of method is still going to be way too expensive to mm. just try out, but um, yeah. so, But I think there are two factors. One factor is the, like the winning lottery thing that you just mentioned, and the, the other factor is that attention is really robust and strong and hard to replace with something that is linear rather than quadratic. Like comparing each token to every other token is just a very powerful operation, I would say. So it's hard to replace that with something more efficient. Why work on parsing while everybody else is working on LLMs? Yeah, I would say that nowadays um, there, there are all these big language models that are getting better and better, but we don't really have so much insight as to how they work under the hood. I mean, we know how they work on an engineering side, and making them better seems to be more of an engineering task nowadays. But um, I'm more interested in actually the underlying understanding language on the theoretical level, and then trying to connect that to what language models do. And so there's always some, some things to be done that are more long-term than this. Were you disappointed when finding out that LLMs do not have any explicitly induced linguistic information or theory in them? I, I wouldn't say I was disappointed. Um, if you have enough data, then you will find all these structures, of course. You can find more than the structures that you would normally put in with theoretical grammars. Um, however, you, you have a lot of data for English language, for example. You might not have as much data for other languages that are low resource. Um, so there it might be harder to actually do just a statistical model that can do it perfectly. And also there are some ways of improving model performance by reintroducing a context-free bias, uh, inductive bias, into the, um, into the model. So you can, you can combine this amazing statistical uh, framework with theoretical grammars and it will actually make things better. Uh, it's not something that you do right now in your work, right? Yeah. I, I think it's interesting because now that ChatGPT is making some of the research directions that we had sort of slightly redundant, uh, people are readjusting and trying to find things that uh, don't just depend on performance but also depend on understanding what it does and um, what you can do with them. So trying to find, for example, humor or sarcasm or other features that we know from a pragmatic uh, real-life uh, application, but actually it's um, not so clear how to make that work with, with language models and statistics. Because 
there was a, a, a keynote at this conference about understanding versus just um, repeating statistics. And I think this is on a lot of people's minds now, the question whether these large language models can actually understand in a meaningful way that we would say means understanding. And what is your opinion about that? Or in which camp are you? I'm in the camp that would say <laughs> there's nothing that prevents them from understanding in the future, but currently we're not quite there yet. Would you agree that large language models understand, at least at a shallow level, or do you think that the argument LLMs are just statistics excludes understanding? Yeah, this is really a question of the perspective that you're taking, right? Um, I, I like the point that um, Geoffrey Hinton was making about um, it, personal experience being just the data that you have available to you, and then understanding is what you do with it. And so um, ChatGPT, for example, is not just a language model, it also has discourse capabilities. And so it also reacts to what you're saying. It's not just predicting the next word, it's actually predicting the best answer to give. And this is, I would say, at some shallow level, because it is working very well, is uh, some sort of understanding. Of course, I don't want to get into the philosophical side of this and say, oh, is it conscious or all these things? <laughs> Does it have free will? Yeah. yeah, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. Obviously. What is the type of work presented here at ACL that you were most excited about? Yeah, so I'm, I'm always happy to see people working on things like interpretability, trying to really understand what all these huge, huge models do. Um, there have been some very interesting ways of using mathematical formalisms to find out um, which parts of the data is more important for the predictions, for example. And so trying to understand these models on a deeper level using theory, that's something I'm very excited about. Um, on the other hand, there are some uh, works, I would say, that are more on the research, uh, on the engineering side, and that are just trying to make these models better and better and um, hit higher, higher benchmarks. And they're exciting in the moment because they can do things that other models maybe couldn't do just before. But I feel like they won't be as interesting in 10 years' time because they, don't, they didn't make a, an underlying contribution to the foundations of the field. It's more... Um, collecting the data, cleaning the data, finding a good architecture, training it very well. And these are important things to be done, and they are hard to do. Yeah. Um, but they, they don't excite me as much as the uh, basic research that goes into understanding them more. Then it is clear that you are most interested in theoretical work, and you present here some theoretical work yourself on parsing. Tell us more about it. Yeah, so this actually sprang out of a course at ETH Zurich, where um, we're teaching students about the beginnings of the, the field of NLP and the underlying foundations and one of these foundations is parsing and so there are these um, parsing algorithms that are always taught uh, CKY early parsing and um, there's also an algorithm that parses that tells you what the probability of a string starting with a certain um, substring is and you can use that as a language model this is what people did before the large language models were around and you can, you can use this to infer a language model and predict the next word. Mm -hmm. And um, these algorithms, they have stood the test of time and have been around for a long time. But we found that there are still improvements to be made. No. Um, and making them faster in, in, in important ways. I would say mainly because um, they give you an understanding. So you can use them for teaching, but you can also combine them with language models, as I said before, and you can make language models better potentially by using by trying to use these grammars again. So what is exactly the complexity gain here? So before we had um, the, the length of the string and the size of the grammar cubed and another term that was uh, the size of the grammar to the power of four. And um, we've, we've reduced this to uh, the length cubed times the size of the grammar squared as the length squared and the Says the grammar cube, which is both contained in this first term and this other term that is to the power of four, which is quite large, yeah, uh, completely true. disappears. And the size of the grammar is actually was actually always the bottleneck uh -huh. for parsing, because if you want to parse uh, English language with a context-free grammar, you get uh, an order of like twenty thousand um, rules that you have to have, and so. This, this quickly becomes dependent on the size of the grammar. So this actually would make it much faster. What is the key idea you apply to get this performance boost? So these kinds of parsing algorithms all depend on dynamic programming, where you uh, trade space for time by saving inter intermittent results. Um, and so 
they already use that, but we found that if you rearrange the equations, you can make more use of that and actually get rid of some large uh, complexity issues and, and make them much more efficient. I was so surprised by the following poster. After so many posters on analyzing large language models, I certainly did not expect an NLP application to astrophysics. Check this out. So, the main motivation is that um, we shoot more and more satellites into space. And this poses some kind of problem or some risks. I don't know if everyone is aware of space debris, but space debris is basically either old satellites or fragments of satellites or even rocket stages, whole rocket stages, that fly around Earth and um, basically could endanger other satellites or if we don't take care of them, it could even make um, the specific orbit unusable for multiple generations um, of humankind, right? So this is a problem not just for ESA, but for everyone. And you can see... Also for Elon Musk. <laughs> also for Elon Musk. Yeah, Starlink gets a bit of bad reputation. But yeah, you can see like one um, example of this problem with the Hubble Space Telescope. So there you can see space debris hit the solar area and damaged it. Um, it looks like a bullet has... Yeah, I mean, these things go crazy fast in orbit. So it basically has the energy of a bullet, if not even more, right? It just goes through like a knife through butter. And one problem is that space engineers are usually not that good in database, writing database queries. So we wanted to assist them by enabling them to use a natural language interface for them to ask queries about the database. So they can ask a question and then this question would be passed into a database query and they just get the answer. The challenges were that we didn't have a training set available. So we had basically had to either start from scratch or could apply some transfer learning to make it easier. Um, this database is updated regu regularly. So obviously if a new satellite is uh, um, launched, then you would also have a new entry in the database that you have to um, take into consideration. And we couldn't use um, an API service such as GPT-3 because ESA likes the data and they like to keep it locally on their system. They don't like to give it to some API, you don't know where it lands, and yeah, it's proprietary stuff. So we had to develop a system. It's in the EU after all, so yeah, we yeah. have Exactly, so there are strong regulations with all of that, so you had to have to keep it online, so we had to create a kind of specialized architecture that could run, for example, on the machine at ESA. What did we do? We applied a specialized a methodology where you have a question in the first step you create a sketch which is a sequence of really basic database um, operations so for example find would mean you find an entity in your database such as Hubble Space Telescope and yeah you have multiple um, basic functions relate query attribute so the first step is you have this sequence of basic operations and in the second step, you then find arguments for the um, specific functions in the sketch. So for find, for this specific question, you want to find something about Hubble, you need to find Hubble Space Telescope to query your database. The good thing is, by um, basically doing this two-step approach, you can first find the sequence and then find the arguments, whereas in traditional approaches you would uh, predict everything together. And the problem with that is if you have this ambiguity, for example, between your question and your, uh, and your argument, so for example Hubble and Hubble Space Telescope, you cannot just rely on your system being able to um, <coughs> basically learn that or um, yeah, be or, or infer from the question um, that you mean this argument. I don't know if that point comes across clearly, but you have to think about... Um, I mean, it could be the Hubble constant, or like, it could be anything about Hubble. It could be anything. This thing could also just be Hubble, tel Hubble telescope. So you have this kind of ambiguity. Yeah. So, and maybe if you have like a training set, it mm -hmm. could learn that Hubble means Hubble Space Telescope. Yeah. But at the moment, 
that you update your database. Maybe there's a new element that it has never seen. And then it could get confused. For example, if you ask for IGS Radar, it's another entity. It needs to, it needs to kind of be able to um, generalize um, to some degree from your question to what is in, actually inside the database. So how do you do it? Yeah, so the architecture, I have to say we didn't develop it ourselves. We took it from the literature and adapted it. But what it does is um, you encode your question with a bird-like language model. You pass it in a gated recurrent unit, a simple uh, decoder, and you first predict your, your basic functions, your sketch. Once you did that, you also encode all your entities that you have in the database with the same bird-like language model. And then in the actual um, prediction step of the arguments, you compare the representation of your database entries, so the names of the entities, for example, with the representation of the decoder at a specific time step. So you do some kind of um, similarity um, or what is the nearest representation in this um, entity space. to go to a restaurant that everyone understands it but you actually need to know the restaurants serve food and when you're hungry I, like when I'm hungry I want food so there's a lot of stuff we don't say which you just leave implicit and when arguments get more complicated finding this implicit knowledge can be very difficult for machines so we want to find a method to find this implicit common sense knowledge and in a structured form so the setting is you're given an argument with a premise and a conclusion and the knowledge graph in our case concept net there's like millions of nodes and there are facts in there like dog is distinct from cat, so just stuff that everyone knows, so common sense knowledge. Um, and then we want to find a subgraph which contains the relevant implicit common sense knowledge. Because up here we have like millions of nodes, so we can't use it directly. Here we have a couple of nodes which we can use in a downstream task. The way people usually do this is that they find a set of entities in the graph, here shown in purple and orange, and then they link them with like all the paths up to a length of three. The problem is that you have hundreds of paths up to length of three in ConcentNet, but only a few of them make sense for your argument. Therefore, we introduce, uh, we use SentenceWord to compute embeddings of the argument, as well as every triplet in the, in the graph. Do you know SentenceWord? It's a method which you put in a sentence and you get an embedding, and then you can compute semantic similarity with these embeddings. This allows us to have a similarity score for every triplet in the graph, which we then convert to an edge weight. And then we use these edge weights to compute weighted shortest paths. And by doing this weighting, we kind of maximize the semantic similarity between the path and the text. So therefore, also intermediate concepts are still relevant for the text. They are like semantically close to the text and therefore relevant. That's the idea. And then we take all these weighted shortest paths and we say, okay, these shortest paths, they form our graph. So it's kind of just the fancy graph extraction method where you put in a text and the knowledge graph and you get back a small graph, which hopefully shows you all the knowledge that you want. Knowledge. Uh, the task that we work on, we are working on argumentation, so that's what we did. Uh, the task was, actually what we did in this paper, is that the, the task is given the premise and the conclusion to predict how, how valid the conclusion is, is it grounded in the premise, and how novel it is. is it, does it bring something new? Because you don't just want to paraphrase. Um, so we take these graphs, we generate them for our whole corpus. We compute structural properties of these graphs. So like, how long are these graphs? How big are they? What is the distance between premise and conclusion? And then we train a classifier on these structural properties. And the idea is that, you know, if the argument is very novel, if the conclusion is very novel, then this graph will be kind of long. Um, and we use this to train this classifier and we perform quite well. And on novelty, we actually outperform a GPT-3 based system. So with a very simple SVM, I think it was in the end, this graph extraction, we can compete with like, you know, GPT-3 and really big language models. Uh, there's another task at Semival this year where we use it to predict frames and documents. Why care about graphs in the era of large language models? Well, ChatGPT works on sequences, so just kind of one line of strings, and graphs are just much more general. So if you can deal well with graphs, you just have a bigger tool at hand, which you can use for 
more different tasks and different applications potentially. Do you see graphs as complementary to language models? Uh, yes, I think there's just so much unstructured text which ChatGPT and similar methods can use really well. And I think that's a tool that we would want to have in the future. Mm -hmm. But I think it could be well augmented with graphs potentially for like inserting background knowledge or even make like the reasoning more explicit, more interpretable. I think there's a lot of avenues there to follow. What are other avenues of research at ACL that you were really excited about? So I work in argumentation where it's, you know, a lot of different stakeholders, people with different perspectives, different backgrounds. And I saw quite a lot of that at the ACL, not necessarily in the context of argumentation, but just like considering data disagreement, not as a noise in the data set, but more like as a feature of people having diff different opinions. Mm -hmm. And I like to, to see that. So it's kind of nice to see that other people also care about people having different opinions, even if it's not argumentation directly. And arguably, RHF has this effect of pushing down on some opinions we do not want and encouraging the ones we want. Yeah, and a lot of opinions in the internet are the ones you don't necessarily want to have. I think that's also a big point of RHF. What do you think is not represented enough at ACL? Ah, uh, that's hard to say. I mean, there are some ideas that I have which were not there, which is good, which is nice. Um, <laughs> I obviously think they are important, but I'm also glad that I haven't seen them. I don't know, I think there's so many, you can't really say what the future will be. So I think it's good that people explore lots of different things. Um, of course, they wouldn't have had the same focus as other people, but I think that's okay and good that people do different things. I wouldn't say that one topic is obsolete. What are best strategies to navigate a large conference such as ACL? So in, do you mean in terms of like finding the stuff you want to yeah, find exactly. or? How to prepare for it, <clears throat> how to do it in real life. Yes, this was my first conference that I attended in person, so I had very little experience. Um, I tried to write a plan beforehand, what posters I want to attend, what sessions I want to attend. I think it was useful for me to kind of just see what are the options, but in the end I didn't use this list. I just <laughs> walked over the poster session and I think I found most of the posters I'm interested in, probably not all of them. Um, I tried to use my list on the first day, but it didn't really work so well for me. I just, I don't know, it was just, then you have to find a poster and you have to search for it and it's just tedious. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I find it best to just walk around and see what looks interesting, talk to people and mm -hmm. yeah, just kind of stroll around and have fun and that we also get to meet you know, interesting people, I think. What would you do differently at the next conference? Or did you do everything perfectly? No, definitely not. But <laughs> I think ironically, I would prepare myself again the same way. So I would still look what is there just to have a grasp of what's there. Um, I would try to, this time I didn't really take a lot of notes during the poster sessions. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if I try to do that now, I will probably miss a lot of stuff that happened on Monday or even Sunday because there's been so much going on. And I think I would try to keep more notes gradually during the conference rather than... I took pictures of the posters so I know where I was, what was interesting, but I didn't necessarily write down why they were interesting. So I might have to go back to the paper, look at them, which is just kind of double the amount of work in some sense. This is actually my first in-person ACL. I've never been in one before. I've been during COVID, I've been to some of the virtual ones with Gather Town with the small, tiny pixels. Um, so I've always wanted to be at a conference like this to learn, see what the field is up to. Um, yeah, yeah. What is the field up to? A lot, a lot of different things. Yeah, yeah, you come in with like all of this background noise of the generative models and what they're doing. Um, and they still dominate. There's still quite a bit of, um, of them around. But uh, I'm, I'm interested to see, you know, a few different topics. So multimodality and how that, how language models are going into multimodality is interesting. Anything around explainability and interpreting uh, transformers or, or LLMs is, uh, I do find interesting. Um, and then you find this sp specific sort of problem. So progress on summarization, progress on, um, uh, let's say, named entity recognition, or let's say the other sort of specific task and how people are uh, multilinguality and translation. Um, so that's like keeping keeping on on, on top of that is, uh, is, is is very interesting for me. Did you find some things that are not exactly about LLMs but still interesting? Well, I, I mean, there's. Uh, there's a few uh, that I don't understand very much, but I'm glad people are like researching these things. So a couple of papers on 
understanding more of the topology of embedding spaces, for example. Um, so that's very complex, but um, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to see people doing more of that. Um, a lot of work on robustness. Evaluation is still sort of one area where we need a lot more uh, development. So uh, always excited to see more and more and better and better work on, on evaluation because that's still on really an unsolved problem. Like until now, it's very hard to tell how you know, uh, how to compare to two different generalist models um, on, on their use cases. So, um, you know, that, that's one area that uh, grabs my attention with the posters. What part of the conference did you benefit most from? I would say the poster sessions for me specifically, because it's like I can grasp a lot of the information. You scan a lot and then you can exploit the ones that interest you. Um, there's a lot of visual explanation which is important i'm a visual learner in a way so people have to put some effort into put visual exp expression of of the poster and the information and uh, so that the for the way i learn posters uh, is a good format for the way I, I like to you know scan and go deeper and then identify the papers and go go read them a little bit later but yeah other people you know some papers surface on your radar before the conference and you sort of go read them. Um, so that's part of the experience, you know, when they announce the papers is one part, but then at the actual conference, for me, it's posters. What would you recommend to a person that attends a conference for the first time? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, there are a bunch. I'm still uh, exploring, yeah, different ways of how, how people, uh, but the, definitely a lot of socializing, a lot of going up to people that you see online or whose work you've but just, yeah, taking that initiative and going up and speaking with people because uh, you don't often, a lot of people aren't, don't have op as much opportunities to talk with everybody in the field like like this when everybody sort of, you know, flies down to one, uh, uh, one event. So just making the most. Uh, yes, <laughs> that's true. These issues. So yeah, just making the most out of making these connections, adding people on LinkedIn and Twitter, and you know, building initial threads that you follow up on when you go back um, is something that just being distant from the field was very difficult for me. And I see conferences make make it a little bit easier. Is there anything you would have liked to see more of? I'm disappointed in the amount of my own personal attention and how little of it uh, I have given just the mountain of smart people and smart work that's that that, that comes together and like we need better tools for let's say exploration and like every week before one of these conferences I'm like okay I'm gonna go embed all the uh, abstracts uh, and then explore them and have a visualization and then identify but I never have the time to actually do that so I'd love for us to apply a little bit of NLP at exploring NLP papers and you know topics that you like um, to make it you know compress and summarize and sort of I identify directly that that's, that's a good app idea. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yes a hundred percent. There are a few one-off. So people would write a blog post here or a blog post there. Maybe semantic scholar or like somebody's like, let's do it for every conference. I would, I would, I would probably pay for that. How did you like Geoffrey Hinton's keynote? Uh, it was, it was very interesting. So I've never, yeah, seen uh, Professor Hinton before. So just yeah, seeing him in 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 person. Um, it was raised the discussion, and it's a discussion that's important for sort of the field to have. Um, there are a lot of words that have different meanings between, you know, apparently different camps. A lot of them that have strong feelings about their meaning uh, of something like... That's specifically to, towards the first part of his talk when he was talking about do, do LLMs understand, really? And there's a lot of uh, back and forth in the field about the word understanding. Um, but I was, I was sympathetic, sympathetic to some of the examples that, that he mentioned, um, and given the definition of understanding that he was sort of um, outlining, that it's not complete, it's just a spectrum, and they un might understand some things, but they don't understand a lot of things. Um, but I haven't really looked into the philosophy of both sides. But uh, um, and then the other side is like, yeah, I've never really heard very much about analog computing. That's the second part. Um, it was interesting for him to mention. He was talking about models and AI, and then it became agents. So I, uh, I'm very interested in how LLMs are paving the way for these uh, LLM-backed agents. And I don't know if that's the 
sense of the term that he, he was using the word agent in. Um, but the ideas of yeah, distillation and weight sharing as, as mechanisms to make these improve faster is, is another interesting takeaway for me from, for, from the keynote. Sorry, that's a long answer, but it's... Uh, no, it's a great uh, answer. Yeah. I think you summarized it really well. And uh, uh, you also had a Twitter thread summarizing these points. Yes. So I think it was well done, so. That's uh, I'm just yeah sharing what I learn and some of the poster presentations um, because yeah you leave here you forget but if you you know write notes or write them publicly even better. We hope you found this video interesting and that you now have a better impression of what happened at ACL 2023 in Toronto. We leave you with some amazing footage of the Niagara Falls. See you next time.